Sandy came from the back country. He never saw a show, even in the old country. And, and we were to, be together in Bergen-Belsen. We were liberated there. He a few years older than I was. He used to bring me water, food, all that. And then both came to America. And uh, I didn't see him for quite a while. So one day after a matinee performance of Girls of Summer, I'm walking down Broadway and there is Alexander. I said, Alexander, hi, what are you doing? He didn't know, he thought directors were like conductors, that they're there at the performance. So he said, I went, I tried to see you, but you weren't there. I said, no, no, directors don't do that. And he said, how do you feel, Jack? I said, how do I feel? I have a flop on Broadway. <laughs> he said, Jack, how wonderful. <laughs> Remember 1945? And someone would say to you, you can have a flop on Broadway, Jack. <laughs> yeah, right. and so, and then I've told the story, and so my friends have used it a lot. Like, for example, uh, after my getting my divorce, uh, I separated, I had to sleep on the couch and uh, saw the kids every once in a while. And Howard is one of my best friends just called me to say, well, how are you doing, Jack? I said, oh, I sleep on a couch. I don't know where I'm going to go. Jack, 45, you're going to be in Paris sleeping on a couch, Jack. <laughs> so in a sense, I have that as a kind of a steady thing. But recently, um, what happened was interesting because you've been reading about the children being taken away and they compared some of that to Auschwitz, you know. Well, it's not so, it's not the same. Uh, in a sense, I don't mean to, <laughs> I wanna give you specifics. In a way, what my mother did was astonishing. Uh, you see, if, if she had wanted to hold on to me, as they, they do here, and upset that the kid was taken away, I don't know if I would have made it. What she did was, if you didn't see the documentary. What you did was, she said, I never wanted to have you. I hated you. Get away from me, I never want to see you again. Pushed me away so that I, I stood there and I, my thought was, I hope she drops dead. If not, I hope I die. I didn't realize what an amazing thing she did. Sure. Instead of saying I want to hold on to a kid, and I'm being taken away, the kind of trauma that would cause, whereas she knew that she had to break and make me feel like what I was losing was, was not that was taken away, but she's the one that hated me. And I went through the entire war in a way of hating her. And people always say, why don't you talk about your mother? I'd never talk. So in this room are two people two people who, who have affected my life. So in France, I did a production of Kafka's Address to the Academy. I did the adaptation and I directed it. And the reason I did it is because I found an epilogue. And in the epilogue, what was wonderful is that uh, no one knew there was an epilogue, you know? Even one woman came to me and said, oh, you wrote the epilogue. I said, yes, I wish I, wish I had, you know. <laughs> but it's an ape who became human. And he tells the academy how he became human. At the end of the lecture, a fan comes into his hotel room and says to him, you know, I'm standing next to you. You don't look like anything of an ape or anything. And the guy opens his shirt and he says, here, smell me here. And the guy says, well, your nose must be better than mine because all I see is something human, you know. And then the guy says to him, you know something? I hate humanity, not individual human beings, but humanity as a whole, I hate. And I realized why I wanted to do that production because I had the same thing. Even in the camp, I was in a death march 
and one of the guards took his rifle, put it under my arm, and carried me. And at that point, if you thought the motorbike guys came along, if they thought you were weak or couldn't make it, they would shoot you. And he said to me, now you stand up, I'll walk straight, I'll come back later, and I'll carry you. And I did manage it, and he did do it. But in this room are two people, too, who have affected my life in a deep way. One is Jack Terrell. Uh, what was amazing is he did it in the lobby of a theater. Jack is also a survivor. We were never together in the camp, but I met him later, a few years ago here in, in New York. So they gave me a tribute at the uh, film forum for my films, and there was a Q&A. And after that, they wanted to know how I made it through and all that. And I told them, well, in LA, I was in analysis four years every day, you know. And uh, I said, and finally, when it was, I had to go to New York, the analyst asked me, what did you learn from all this? And uh, I said, well, that, you know, I don't have to be afraid, people are gonna kill me, that, uh, you know, I can make progress. He said, no, 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 Jack. You came here because of a divorce. I want to know what you feel about women, about a woman, right? And I said, well, I couldn't answer. I said, let me think about it, and I'll come back. I came back two weeks later, and I said, I, you have to help me. I know you don't want to word it, but you have to tell me. He said to me, Jack, you were 13 years old you, you, when you were in Auschwitz. You couldn't save your sister who was 10 years old. Stop being attracted to women you want to save, okay? So I lived with that, I told that story. There was an intermission. I go into the hall, Jack, who is a famous analyst in New York, came up to me and said, well, uh, that analyst, Jack, was on the right track. He didn't get it right, Jack. I said, what do you mean? It was not your sister. It was your mother. I can imagine. I could hardly go back. And I realized my terrible relationship, in a way, even with women, that after that, that I didn't, not only didn't trust, because so many loved me, but I, I didn't recognize that love. They were able to love me and able to, you know. For example, one woman in, in, in France, uh, and, I, and she knew that I couldn't love back, we broke up at one point. And then about 10 years ago, I, and I thought, I said to Natalia, I said, you know, I realized that that woman loved me. And I had no idea, I could have no sense. And I'm teaching a class and the door opens. And who is there? She's there, and she says, Oh, I'm sorry to disturb you, Jack. I'm in the cafe and I saw your name. I'm here with my kids. I'd love to talk to you. So I went and I talked to her and I said, Elizabeth, I wanted to tell you how sorry I am about the way I treated you. I just feel awful. And so she said to me, Jack, I understood. It's the war, Jack. I understood that. And I realized that there were so many women that loved me. That some just rejected me, of course, normal. And, uh, and so uh, all happened in a way I began to realize that I have a real problem in relation to that. Because Jack made me aware about the real love that I had and the real love that was given to me by my mother. And so, 
I went through life without dealing with the emotions and the feelings that, that I went through until the second person in this room. I met Natalia and suddenly things came out I hadn't thought of. I, it, it came through in my work, but as far as my life, I never dealt with it. I never, 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 never dealt with the idea of the love of what you can build with a, what, what a woman can do to you, you know. Because obviously that incident in Auschwitz, you know, my mother pushing me away that way when I was 13. And I felt she preferred my sister because she stayed with my, with my, with my sister. And so what, what happened with Natalia now, it goes on the fact that I experienced things I never knew because I was a kid when all this happened. I only knew I had a feeling. What it was I didn't understand, okay? For example, they were doing a documentary and they found the first apartment that I went to in New York to my uncle's house, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, and they, and so uh, Yitzhak Perlman's son now owns the apartment. When they told him that I had been there and I wanted to see it again, and he said, oh, absolutely, he knew about me. He was happy that he could do it. I walked into the apartment, something I would have never realized. I walked into the apartment and I suddenly felt, I said, my God, I slept on the couch. And he looked at me and said, what? He slept on the couch? He didn't have a bed or anything? I said, no, no, after a while, they put me into a rooming house. You know, I no longer stayed there. But I suddenly realized when I was there in that room, the fact of what happened to me when I came to America. Because when my uncle got in touch with me in Sweden, I thought I would have a family again. It'd be wonderful. And so when I arrived, I couldn't end up in New York because there was a storm, so I couldn't see the, the Statue of Liberty. So I was told my uncle will be in, in, at Penn Station. And then I arrived with, with a guy from the charity organization. My uncle was there. I think he just maybe didn't even kiss me, just sort of maybe embraced me. And I suddenly realized, oh my God, in Sweden, I was a kid who had gone through the camps and I was heroic like a soldier who had gone through the war. And here, through my uncle, I suddenly realized, oh, I'm, I'm a refugee. I have no money, I'm no family, nobody. I, and I didn't know that. All I knew was the feeling. But this time, all these things became very specific to me, what, in a sense of what I had to cope with. and. Uh, and what's remarkable about what she's brought me is that almost every day something new comes up in our life where I realize things about my life that I could never articulate, that through her I opened up and I'm able to trust a woman in terms of the deepest part of my life and what that she's given me in return, you know, as a human being. So. This is a birthday that I said for the first time, I see things through her that I never saw before. And I thank you for coming. <laughs>